folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place for all things fantasy and sci-fi, with frequent forays into other fascinating, fun topics, such as Japanese animation, and uh, superhero movies, and uh, history. Right now, I'm going to talk about another thing I haven't visited yet, the great American Western novel. But before we get into that, a plug! A novel that Mrs. Desperado and I wrote together, our first collaborative effort, a more of a novella, I guess, but it's a lot of fun. It's a steampunk called Miss Ione D and the Mayan Marble. It's about a 19-year-old American girl who goes with her family to Guatemala and has adventures in the Mayan pyramids. Lots of, uh, lots of, uh, creepy villains and, uh, heroic heroes. And we've got illustrations like a lot of, uh, like a lot of books from that period had uh, made by local authors. So please check it out. It's on Amazon. I'll put a link and it is available in both in ebook, but if you want the pictures, you gotta get the physical copy. Now, back to our scheduled program. Now, westerns were a really big deal when I was growing up, and I have seen a lot of western, western movies, and I've watched a lot of western uh, TV shows. And westerns were my father's favorite thing. His favorite show was Bonanza. And my, one of my personal favorites was the Wild Wild West, which is this weird sci-fi western about these uh, secret service agents. So it had like the spy thing going on and, and all sorts of, and all sorts of like uh, weird crazy gadgets. It's definitely the forerunner to steampunk. But I haven't read a lot of Western books, in fact, until recently. I don't really remember reading any Western novels at all as a, as a boy. Uh, when we were assigned in school, which, when, which was called When the Legend Die, it was about a Native American rodeo rider by Hal Borland. And I remember just how many times the poor guy got his bones broken. <laughs> Maybe one of these days I'll read it again. I'm going to start with number 11. Even though this is kind of a top ten of my Western novels I've read recently, I'm gonna I'm gonna be like Spinal Top Tap, and I'm gonna have eleven. So this one is All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy, uh, Alfred Knopf, 1992. Now McCarthy is known for writing grim novels, and this one has its share of tragedy, but it's not nearly as depressing as The Road, for example. It involves two teenage boys from Texas. They head into Mexico to seek work as cowhands. It takes place in 1949. At first, I didn't want to include it because I thought, well, that's too modern. But in Mexico, you know, there was a, still a lot of this caballero-type culture a, at the time. So I figured, yeah, I figured it works. Uh, but um, the spirit of the story is very Western in that sense. It's got a lot of great language. Uh, I mean, old... You know, old uh, Texas slang from that era, and uh, the boys, of course, they speak Spanish fluently, or they wouldn't get along in Mexico, and uh, they go to work for a wealthy rancher, and one of them falls in love with his daughter, and of course, the rancher's had none of it. He doesn't want her to marry a uh, dirt poor gringo, <laughs> and so the boys get into some trouble, got a fair bit of trouble with um, corrupt lawmen, and... Uh, you know, a, a another fellow American kid who gets himself into some serious trouble. So it's it's interesting and rather realistic and gritty. But but you definitely sympathize for these boys. Number ten, a classic, Shame, by Jack Schaefer, Hewitt Mifflin, 1949. And this was spawned a very, very famous movie, 1953, by director George Stevens, starring Alan Ladd. Uh, very, one of the most, I guess, the most popular Western movies of, of all time. I, I sort of remember seeing it as a, as a boy, although it was so long ago, I don't remember much of it. But the setting is Wyoming in 1889. And the protagonist of the book is Bob Starrett, a, a son, a homesteader's boy in a homesteading family. And this uh, mysterious stranger comes in, his name is Shane, and he is, has this dark past. Uh, 
everybody figures he was a gunfighter, but he puts his guns away and he's trying to, you know, eschew violence and uh, he works as a hired hand for the Starrett family. And uh, little Bob, he just worships this guy. And uh, Shane tries to avoid trouble, but of course trouble comes to him and he ends up having to defend the good people from this uh, evil cattle man named Luke Fletcher who's trying to take over everybody's land. And uh, I liked it. It was fun. It was a good uh, good and evil story, good versus evil story. It's a little bit much, though. This, this boy just basically worships the ground this cowboy walks upon. So that part gets a little bit old, but uh, nonetheless, Shane's a pretty pretty cool guy, pretty pretty cool character. Number nine by a relatively unknown writer, which I whom I want to promote. It's called Brings Brings the Lightning, Book One of the Ames Archives. This is by Peter Grant, uh, Sedgefield Press, 2016. Now, Peter Grant is a South African. Um, he's a white guy, uh, emigrated to the United States, and uh, he was a minister also. <laughs> And it's amazing what he knows about the American West. And it, the protagonist is Walt Ames, a young Confederate war veteran, who comes back home, sees how devastated everything is, but he meets his former school teacher, who isn't that much older than he is. He marries her and uh, resolves to move out west so they can make their fortune. But on the way, they have a lot of troubles. You know, they have a lot of challenges to meet. And uh, it's got a lot of details about life at that time, about what kind of supplies. Uh, you know, a wagon train would need, and so on. Talks a lot about guns. This this writer has a lot of knowledge, and uh, that was the biggest drawback. Was that some places there's so much knowledge and so much detail that's there's less story. It has a really really strong beginning beginning though, very very gripping, where uh, Walt is about to be ambushed by some bushwhackers in you know kind of a lawless society just after the war, and there's some great stuff after and on their way out when they have to deal with hostile Indians and uh, uh, bandits and so on. Brings the Lightning is actually a name that the some of the friendly tribes give him because he has knowledge of guns, therefore Lightning. He's earned their respect. So I definitely recommend this. He's written other, other Western books and I think other genres as well, perhaps even sci-fi if I remember correctly. Definitely check him out if you like westerns. Number eight, The Open Range Men, Lauren Payne, Dorchester Publishing, 1990. Kind of stumbled upon this one. Uh, it was one of the audible free entries. Yeah, it was pretty good though. Uh, it was a a very interesting story, classic kind of range war uh, theme of uh, cowboys who wander around against those who want to fence off the range and uh, have private property. And there's a small group of men led by Boss Spearman that have, they don't have a ranch at all, they just move their cattle around. And of course people are fencing off the land and they know their days as open rangers is are numbered, but unfortunately they have to, they meet with the, an end sooner than they expected with some really violent and vicious um, local uh, strong men in this particular town they go into. I believe it was New Mexico, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this was made into a 2003 movie uh, by Kevin Costner, and it stars Robert Duvall, Kevin Costner, and Annette Bening. Uh, I have not seen the movie. It sounds pretty interesting. I guess Kevin Costner dedicated this to his parents, and, and his father particularly was fond of westerns. Number seven, The Virginian. Yes, that one. They made the TV series of, about Owen Wister, Macmillan, 1902. This was one of the very first Western novels. It was kind of, it kind of started the genre. And uh, as I said, it's as I may have said, it spawned a TV series. It was a very long-running TV series, NBC, 1962 to 1971. Also, five movie versions, starting the first one in 1914, the last in 2014. If you don't count, a made-for-TV movie as well. And in the protagonist, the narrator, is a, is a professor from out east who's coming out to see the West and learn about this stuff. And he meets this 
this uh, mysterious kind of quiet stranger from Virginia, which he calls the Virginian. And you never learn the Virginian's real name, nor do you need to learn the professor's name. Uh, and it's, it's very, it's got some very old-timey language, you know, very descriptive and flowery, uh, kind of old-timey. If you, you know, you may have a hard time getting through it. Some people do. I didn't. I, I love the old, old-time kind of uh, flowery prose. And uh, the setting is Wyoming in the, in the late 1890s. And as I said, it's a bit melodramatic. The cowboys, as exemplified by the Virginia, are chivalrous gentlemen. And even the villains, even the villains are, do have a sense of honor. Later on in the book, uh, one of the guys is caught for cattle rustling and ready to hang, be hanged. And he's, he takes it like a man. He, oh well, you know, I had my, I had my shot, <laughs> that kind of thing. I took my chances and I lost. Even he is, is kind of, he doesn't want to go down like a coward. So it's got this manly code of the West involved. There's some also some, some funny comedy, including one case, one scene where, as a prank, uh, all these parents, his friends who all had what, new wives and babies, uh, have brought them to this hoedown, and they switch the babies around into different clothes, and when they, they leave without checking the babies, and they leave with the wrong babies. <laughs> Very silly. Uh, Maybe a little implausible, but it... You know, it makes the makes the book look kind of fun. Number six, a totally different, a totally different uh, theme, as as they say in Monty Python. Now for something completely different. Uh, Welcome to Hard Times by E. L. Doctorow, Simon and Schuster, 1960. This was written as a satire originally. It was what the Doctorow set out to do, and he ends up writing more westerns. <laughs> but it's about a town in the Dakota Territory that encapsulates the hopes of the settlers and the disappointments and tragedies that happened to them. Uh, this, the town was originally, how was the name, something like Prosperity or something, I forget. Uh, and it came to a horrible end when this drifter, this violent, vicious drifter comes in and he shoots the place up and kills, kills people and burns it down. And, and most of the townspeople are too cowardly to face him. And when they rebuild it, it's... Uh, they name it hard times because as a good luck charm, well, let's go opposite. If we had it, if we called it a good name before and we had bad luck, if we, if we have a bad name, we'll have good luck. Well, of course, things don't go quite as, as well as expected. And they always have this fear of the, uh, bad, the bad man from Bodie, as they call him, coming back. And especially the protagonist who is, uh, is kind of the town archiver or kind of the town... Uh, I guess he's made the mayor just because nobody else wants to do it, and he, he has to handle, he's the one who has to deal with uh, criminals and stuff and, and trouble, so uh, it, <laughs> it's, uh, it definitely keeps your interest. This was made into a film in 1967 starring Henry Fonda. Number five, one of the most iconic westerns ever, Riders of the Purple Sage by Zane Grey, Harper and Brothers, 1912. Yes, 1912. I mean, if, if Owen Wister started the genre in 1902, uh, Zane Grey popularized it in 1912. And this is one of the best loved Western books of all time. And it's set in southern Utah in 1871. It's got amazing descriptions of the, of the nature and the animals and the beautiful landscapes. It's a bit melodramatic. Um, it's got a lot of stereotypical tropes, but you have to remember, Zane Grey started them. <laughs> He didn't steal this stuff from other people. He, he thought this up himself, and other writers used them. So if you think it's a little predictable, that's why. Just a little bit about the, about the plot. It involves a, um, a Mormon woman who is, being, is having a lot of trouble with the church fathers who are trying to, you know, they don't like, she's a widow, and they don't like her running her own place, and they're trying to, you know, get her property by forcing her to marry and so forth, and, and an outsider comes in to help her. And uh, it got into a little hot water because it was seen as anti-Mormon. It, 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 it was an era when the church still accepted polygamy, and this is, that was one of the things that the, 
that the uh, narrator rails against is, is polygamy. Uh, there were five movie adaptations of this book, uh, starting in 1918 and as late as 1996. Uh, Zane Grey, of course, was one of the greatest Western writers of all times. He wrote 57 novels, 28 set in my home state of Arizona. And he had a famous cabin here near Payson, uh, where he lived in the 1920s, later abandoned. It burned down in a wildfire, and they basically rebuilt it a replica in 1990, and no, in 2005. Number four. This is a heck of a title. That's a real mouthful. The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford by Ron Hansen, Hansen Knopf, uh, 1983. This is a fictionalized version of a real historical incident when the supposedly, the seemingly unstoppable outlaw, Jesse James, was killed by his his uh, treacherous cousin and confederate, Robert Ford, um, wanting a, for the reward. <laughs> he, he's basically killed his cousin for the reward. It's a very true-to-life book with a lot of historical details, and it paints Jesse and his gang as they really were. I mean, they were kind of considered gentlemen outlaws. Uh, Jesse was a PR genius you know, giving away some of his uh, ill-gotten gains and, and taking on banks which people hated. But uh, in reality, he could be pretty vicious. In, Nor in Northfield, Minnesota, where they tried to rob the bank, uh, some of the citizens fought back, and he, he shot, you know, teenage boys if they came at, came at him. So he wasn't entirely a good guy. Interestingly enough, uh, Mrs. Desperado has a family story to tell about this. Her great-grandparents encountered uh, Jesse James and his brother <laughs> came to their home in Oklahoma uh, and uh, they knew who these guys were but you know they didn't dare turn them down <laughs> and they they had a dinner with them uh, she even said the family even recalls what it was they had ham <laughs> and like what was it ham and, and uh, I think apples, I think, uh, I think uh, apple a cobbler or something like that for dessert. And the, the James brothers were very gracious. They left each of the family members a silver dollar under their plates. Uh, so interesting uh, family story. This was made in uh, a movie in 2007 starring Brad Pitt. And also is featured in a song on... Uh, Bruce Springsteen's uh, folk album uh, recently. I think it was called. I think it was called "We Shall Overcome." A very, uh, very cool, uh, very cool uh, album as well. Number three. Here's the other icon of Western literature, and this is Louis L'Amour. Now we had. Uh, Zane Grey in the early part of the 20th century and Louis L'Amour in the latter part. Grey died in 1938. L'Amour first published his first novel in 1950 and uh, died in the late 80s. So they pretty much cover the 20th century. Uh, L'Amour was also born in my home state of North Dakota in the town of Jamestown. This one I selected is called The Lonesome Gods. It was published uh, 1983 Bantam. Uh, the copy I have is marked as designated Louis L'Amour's Lost Treasures. So I guess this one isn't that well known, although I did see some really good reviews online for this. And it's this one involves a uh, young boy whose uh, who's, uh, mother dies of uh, disease and his father's dying of cancer. And he his father's trying to bring him out west before he dies and to make up with the, the boy's estranged grandfather because the uh, the grandfather was from a Los Angeleno he was a wealthy Spanish guy uh, who uh, had this beautiful daughter this Anglo guy comes in and marries her and he doesn't approve and he's trying to kill the guy <laughs> and so the uh, father is hoping that the grandfather will accept 
this grandson now that he's a teenager. Um, but you know the father gets killed by bandits, and the son, grandson has to make his way with uh, not only uh, have to deal with his um, very unforgiving grandfather, but also you know with bandits and and uh, some uh, renegade Indians and so on. Of course, some friendly Indians as well, and uh, and it's a very uh, I love the atmosphere. I love the uh, way. Uh, I love the way this was really puts you there. Now, Lamour was even more prolific than Zane Grey. He wrote around a hundred novels, almost all of the westerns, uh, from starting 1950 to 1987, and had over. 30 movies and TV adaptations made, a lot of them in the 1950s, so I haven't seen that many of them. I remember the TV series Hondo in 1967, they you remember that. Um, I think it was, I think it took place in Arizona because it was something to do with the Apaches. Um, oddly enough, the one I've seen was a 1972 comedy with Bob Hope on it called Cancel My Reservation. I had no idea that Lamar wrote it. And, uh, it was a very silly movie with uh, Buddy Hackett playing a Chickasaw Indian. <laughs> I probably couldn't do that these days. Number two, I'm getting one that this one I really, really loved, really enjoyed. You've probably heard of it, Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry, Simon, Simon & Schuster, 1985. This was made into a very famous miniseries um, on CBS in 1989 starring Robert Duvall, Tommy Lee Jones, and Danny Glover. It involves a couple of uh, Texas Rangers, former Texas Rangers, relocating their ranch from the Rio Grande uh, to Montana. And uh, they are very memorable characters, uh, kind of opposites, but they're best friends. The, the Augustus McCray and the Woodrow Call. And Augustus being a, being a drinker and a, I mean, he's like one of these guys. He's, he's carefree, loves to, loves to talk, loves to drink. And Call is a very serious, hard-bitten guy. He no nonsense, works all the time. And uh, Danny Glover's part. So these that that's Robert Duvall and Tommy Lee Jones, respectively. Danny Glover's part is his Dietz, um, their black rat ranch hand. Well, one of many, but he's the he's the scout. He's like he's like um, pretty amazing in the book. And interestingly enough, this was originally written as a script for Peter Bogdanovich in 1972 following uh, McMurtry's successful uh, last picture show. And he wanted to do another another uh, movie with McMurtry, so McMurtry wrote the script. They couldn't get it made. He bought the rights back, published it in 1985. But uh, what, what I love about this book is that there's so many memorable characters, and there's there's like, there's like tragedy, there's comedy, and you, you really get the feeling for the way things were and, and how even like crossing a river when there's no bridge can be really, really dangerous. <laughs> honorable mention. Yes, I have to have an honorable mention. Texas by James Mishner, Random House, 1985. I mentioned this book before, and I read it because uh, I was thinking, and I'm still thinking about writing a book taking, that takes place in Texas. Kind of a steampunk type of thing. Uh, and I thought, what better way to learn Texas history than by the master of historical fiction? So this is one of these huge sweeping novels that goes from early Spanish colonial history of what's now Texas, Tejas in the time, till into the 1980s. And naturally there's a big section about ranching and cowboys and so forth, and the cattle business, and fighting the fierce Comanche. Uh, one of the most memorable characters I recall was a woman who was abducted by the Comanche as a girl and uh, they could be very cruel. I mean, not only to not only to whites and, and Mexicans and blacks, but also to other Native Americans, including the fierce Apache. <laughs> but anyway, they uh, this poor girl had her nose burned off, and when she was rescued, uh, she was she was so traumatized that she hardly spoke. But they made her a wooden nose. <laughs> cover up her injury, and uh, she ended up marrying a missionary and becoming a very successful 
Catwoman. She was essentially the brains of the, of the outfit. So it, it's a lot of, there's a lot of Western, true to life Western stuff in this novel. And, and it was actually made into a TV movie in 1994, which is hard to believe because this covers so much ground. <laughs> How could you make anything but a series out of it? Number one, a movie that you have surely heard, heard of, even if you've never seen a Western in, in your life, True Grit by Charles Portis, Simon & Schuster, 1968, made into two very famous movie versions. Now, this was published as a serial in, nine, in uh, 1968, as I said, in the Saturday Evening Post. And this was um, one of these weekly magazines that was so popular at the time, uh, kind of gone by the wayside, which is sad, but that's technology and stuff. Published in chapters or in bits, and uh, later as a full book. It takes place in Arkansas and the Indian Territory, now called Oklahoma, in the 1870s. The plot, a lot of you probably know the plot. It's a 14-year-old girl named Maddie Ross. Her father has been killed by this ruthless drifter uh, called Tom Chaney. And she's not going to take this lying down. She hires U.S. Marshal Rooster Cogburn to capture him. Now, he's, he's this kind of has-been. He's a drunk. He's got one eye missing. He wears an eye patch. You know, I mean, people, he's got a vicious temper. But, I mean, so that's kind of why he allows himself to be hired, because he's, he's down in his luck. There's also this Texas Ranger named Le, Le Beauf, or Le Beef, who's looking for Cheney as well, because he murdered a senator. So they decide they're going to go after him together and leave... Maddie out of it because she's a girl. They don't want her to get endangered, but she insists. She's very stubborn and ends up coming along with them. And, and what that's one thing I really love about this is you have this strong female character. Now I remember this movie from the, from my youth, and I've recently rewatched it. Uh, classic, classic, classic with John Wayne as Mr. Cogburn. Uh, Kim Darby played Maddie, and Glenn Campbell, yeah, the, the country singer, uh, played Le Beauf, Le Beef. <laughs> the 2010, the Coen Brothers redid it, and this is what sparked my interest, my recent interest in Westerns, is seeing the Coen Brothers version of True Grit, in which they cast Jeff Bridges as Rooster, Matt Damon as Le Beauf, Le Beef, <laughs> and uh, I can't pronounce, I don't remember how you say that, and uh, Haley Steinfeld as Maddie, and I actually liked the second version better, because it was, for one thing, it was truer to the book, you know, after having read the book afterward, this was truer, and uh, I loved the dialogue, very old-timey, very formal. Uh, just, just the way she would speak, Mr. Cogburn, and she would, she would use all these, this really uh, flowery language. You know, you're lucky you, these days you can get a 14-year-old to um, speak in complete sentences. <laughs> and this girl's tough enough to hire, to hire a, you know, a mercenary to go get her father's killer. I, I like her. So that has been my survey of the great American Western novel. Thanks for sticking with me. I'm no expert by any means, so please let me know what your favorites are, and I might just read them too and do another another redo of this, eventually with some, some more great Western novels. Uh, thanks again, as I've said before. You can support, my, support me by checking out my books on Amazon. And for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.